We're going to pick up where we left off last time. In last class, we went through the bacterial diseases that affect the skin, and we started the bacterial diseases that affect the nervous system. Okay? So just a quick review, the diseases that affect the skin, we learned most of those are superficial infections, and a lot of times we're looking at infections where the normal microbiota, such as staph or strep, goes somewhere it's not supposed to go. And that can be something as simple as staph goes down into a hair follicle and you get a pimple. Or it can be all the way a little more extreme, you get impetigo. Or you get systemic impetigo, which is scald skin syndrome. Or you can have a really mad strain of staph that is antibiotic resistant or extremely virulent, something of that nature. And you can end up with necrotizing fasciitis, which is that flesh-eating bacteria. So we looked kind of at a broad range of skin infections. We learned how Pseudomonas is the most common cause of an ear infection. So the generic term swimmer's ear just means ear infection. doesn't mean anything special. We learned that the um, generic term pink eye just means just conjunctivitis. It's any infection in the eye. And then we looked at two real specific eye infections with Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis, which are more serious eye infections. Okay. Then we moved into diseases of the nervous system, and we learned what a few terms meant. What does meningitis mean? What are the meninges? It's the, the layers that surround your nervous system. So meningitis would be an inflammation due to an infection in the meninges. Encephalitis would be an inflammation due to infection of the entire brain itself, right? So we said when we get any of these infections of the nervous system, we can get a meningitis or an encephalitis, or you can actually get both. And then the long-term effects of the nervous system diseases will really depend on how much of the bacteria you have in your nervous system, how long it stays there, and most importantly, where in your particular parts of your nervous system that it's affecting. You know, we went into details last time. If you have damage to the temporal lobe on the side, that may damage your hearing. But I may get the same exact microbe, and instead of being in my temporal lobe, he starts damaging my frontal lobe. So that could just change my personality and have no effect on my hearing. So the long-term effects of these disorders, you can't just pinpoint one particular thing. It just depends on each individual person that gets the infection. Okay? In the nervous system, we learned there are three most common bacteria that can cause bacterial meningitis. Okay? The good thing for us, there are vaccines for each of these. Okay? Well, bad thing for us, though, in this particular room, most of us are not vaccinated against them, but your children will be. Okay? And I believe we ended here with listeriosis, correct? So do you guys remember where listeria monocytogenes is usually found? Processed meat, hot dogs, processed sandwich meat, uh, Vienna sausage, things like that. And if you're a very young child or if you're a pregnant woman, you have to stay away from these things so you do not end up with listeriosis, long-term side effects from the infection. Okay? So let's pick up now and start talking about some new diseases. Real quickly, though, what are the three things you need to know about each disease? Etiology, so what bacteria causes it. Second thing, how you get it. And then the third thing, what does it do to you? The um, signs or symptoms. And remember, don't learn things like headache, fever, fatigue. That's kind of generic for everything. You want to find that sign or symptom that is unique to that disease. All right, so let's pick up with tetanus. It is caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani. Now, when I say the word Clostridium, that genus, you should remember that Clostridium bacillus and Sporosarcina are the three genera that can make something very special. What can they make? It's written up there. Endospores. They can all make endospores. Why does that matter? What does an endospore do? hard to kill an endospore. 
So what do you think these diseases are going to be? Severe diseases or just whatever kind of just, yeah, you'll get over it diseases? Severe diseases. Because if it's hard to kill the microbe when he's not in your body, don't you think it's going to be pretty hard to kill him once he's in there? Heck yeah, right? And not only does it make it hard to kill, but you don't even have to be exposed to the microbe. You can be exposed to just the endospore and still get the infection. So that needs to be something that kind of automatically pops up out of the filing system in your brain when you see Clostridium or Bacillus. We're going to see that quite a bit today, actually. Okay? So back to Clostridium tetani. It is an endospore-forming bacteria. The endospores are very commonly found in the dirt. Okay? And where is dirt? Everywhere. It's not just on the ground outside. If you walked into here, is it possible that there are Clostridium tetani spores on the ground in here? Very possible, right? So it's easier just to say and remember that you can find these Clostridium endospores everywhere. Okay? So if I had asked you at the beginning, how do you get tetanus, what's the generic answer? Step on a rusty nail. Okay? Well, here's the most important thing I want you guys to walk away from right now. The rust has absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay? The reason that has kind of come to be something everybody remembers is if a nail has been sitting out in the dirt for a long period of time, what's going to happen? It's going to rust. Okay? So it really has nothing to do with the rust. All you have to do to get tetanus is have any type of open wound come in contact with the dirt. And we just said dirt could be anywhere. So I could just as easily get tetanus from walking around outside and step on a brand new nail that just fell out of a box and landed on the ground as I would a nail that's been sitting in the dirt for 20 years and it's gotten rusty. It has absolutely nothing to do with the rust. Okay? So assuming no vaccinations have happened, here's the progression of tetanus. Let's say I cut my leg when I'm outside I'm working in the yard. I cut my leg. That stick cuts me on the side of my leg, and one of those endospores, just takes one, gets into that open wound. Once inside my body, that endospore will germinate, become a living bacteria. Then that living bacteria is going to move into my nervous system, into the ends of the nerves at the neuromuscular junction. So what the fancy word for, it's going to move to the place where my nervous system meets my muscles. Okay? First thing that tends to happen are what we call tetanospasms, okay, another big word. The bacteria produces a toxin, and as that toxin is released, it sends a signal that makes your muscle contract, relax, contract, relax. So you get a twitch. A lot of times you'll see the twitch in the fingers or in the extremities, not because the bacteria is more in your extremities, just because it's a smaller piece of your body to move. It's a lot easier for your finger to twitch than it is for your whole leg to twitch. There's just a whole lot more body to move than just a finger. Okay? A lot of people would say, no, you get locked jaw if you get tetanus. Well, what is your jaw? It's a movable joint, right? The reason you get the pain in the jaw is because you're having a toxin-related spasm in your jaw. So you can get locked jaw. Now here's where it continues. Following the small spasms of muscles, you get violent convulsions. A violent convulsion is different from a spasm. The violent convulsions make the entire body flex, extend, hyperextend. So the body is basically folding in half and then bending over backwards. And the body continues to do those violent convulsions. A lot of people believe that um, you know, there's a lot of writings of people that were possessed by demons that were able to break their own backbones. Is that possible? I don't know about the demon possession. I'm not going to be the one that says it's not, okay? No, I didn't say that. But I can tell you that if you have tetanus, you can break your own backbone. So a lot of people have related those things to each other. Once you have convulsed violently for sometimes days, at least hours, you become paralyzed in the hyperextended position, which is what this picture is on the screen. You can tell how old that drawing is by the type of drawing. Okay? You then remain paralyzed in that position until the muscles around your lungs paralyze and you suffocate to death. So 
So what do you think about tetanus? How many of you are really glad that you have a tetanus vaccine? All right. Be very glad you live in the United States. All right. You need a tetanus vaccine every 8 to 10 years. When's the last time you got your tetanus vaccine? Probably kindergarten. That's a very good answer. That's when most of you probably got your last tetanus vaccine. They made you. Yeah, to, go to, to get into school, they made you. I'm just going to say that I'm not an advocate of go spend thousands of dollars to get vaccinated. I know you guys are a group of students and you don't have that kind of money. But a tetanus shot is not expensive. If you even remotely cut yourself and you're outside, go get a tetanus shot. Okay? Very, very important. So I have some videos I'm going to let you watch real quick to show you some children with tetanus. Now, in the United States, we are all vaccinated against tetanus. In other countries, they are not. And it is very common for children to contract tetanus during the birthing process. Babies are not born in sterile hospital rooms in other countries. They're born at home, and the floor is not ceramic tile. It's dirt. So a lot of times, mom and baby contract tetanus during the birthing process. Okay? So just to give you, i got a couple of them. So this is a little boy that has tetanus. Okay. You can see his body is now paralyzed in the arched back position. Okay. He is going to lay there for several days until he just suffocates to death. And once it gets to this point, there is absolutely nothing that can be done about it. If you go to the doctor when you just have lockjaw or some of the primary symptoms, they can treat you. But if it's already progressed to this, there's nothing that can happen for you. Okay? So then I have an even younger child with tetanus. And I think this is an interesting video. It shows you how stiff the body really is. You see, they lift the baby up just to show you that the baby is completely paralyzed. Body is stiff. Is that not horrible? Now this video is a really good video. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but I recommend that you watch it at some point. It's a UNICEF video. This is a video um, of groups of people that go around the world trying to vaccinate other countries that don't have the ability to vaccinate themselves. I get rid of this stupid girl. All right. So I like this video. It shows you kind of the progression. So some of the first babies you'll see, these are healthy babies because it's kind of a public service announcement, you know, show you the healthy ones and show you the sick ones. But some of the first babies you see, I want you to notice, you'll see their little arm kind of shake. Their little arm will twitch. And then it kind of progresses so you can see how it changes. It also shows a mother that has developed tetanus. So there's a man carrying her in the video as we get going. So here's a baby that has already progressed through the spasms, now paralyzed. This is a woman paralyzed, having to be carried around. So this is a baby that's just been diagnosed. You see his little feet and his little hands, but it gets they'll keep the video on him a little bit longer here in just a second. Just watch the little arm. See that little arm? Just a minor little twitch, and it can turn into that. But again, I really recommend you watch this video at your own time because it's eight minutes long. But it's, it's really neat, especially if, you, if you're a religious person. It even goes through the Bible and shows you where different passages in the Bible, they believe they're talking about children that had tetanus. So it's just a disease that's been around forever. Okay? All right. That is a really upbeat way to start the class, I know. But what do you guys, you guys understand? Okay. All right. Now, I didn't say this specifically. You get a tetanus shot when you get a DTP. The T is the tetanus. Or you can get just a tetanus shot. So there is a combo that we were all forced to get when we were going into kindergarten. But as an adult, if you cut yourself and you go to the doctor, they don't have to give you the whole shot. They can give you just a tetanus shot. So they can give you just that. Okay. All right. Next disease is botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum. So again, we see that Clostridium. We immediately think we're dealing with an endospore, right? This bacteria, once ingested, 
moves into your nervous system, begins to block all of your acetylcholine receptors, which we're not an AMP class. What happens is it moves and it blocks the little receptors that make your muscles contract. So your muscles will receive the acetylcholine contract, but they can't ever get out of the uncontracted state. So botulism leads to paralysis. Again, paralysis leads to can't move the muscles around your lungs, so you suffocate to death. Okay? Now there's a silver lining to this story. As an adult, it's pretty hard for you to get botulism that proceeds to the paralysis state because your immune system is nice and healthy. Your, bacteria, your, your um, intestines are full of bacteria that are good for you. So when you ingest the Clostridium botulinum, there's no room for him. But if a baby ingests the bacteria or someone that's a little immunocompromised, then we can talk a much more serious problem. Clostridium botulinum is most commonly found in home processed sausage. You may think, I would never make my own sausage. You live in Mississippi. A lot of people make their own deer sausage. They kill the deer, they cut the meat out themselves, and they process it. Okay? So when you go eat deer, meat, deer sausage at your buddy's house, you may be eating home processed sausage and you don't realize it. Okay? If you buy sausage in the grocery store, they put nitrates in your sausage so you don't have to worry about it. It destroys the bacteria. But home processed sausage is a problem. Also, improperly canned food items. If you, have any of you ever canned foods yourself, like green beans, jellies, anything like that? Okay, one person, two people. I have. Okay. If you can something at home, you're supposed to can it, and you've got to do it properly. You've got to boil everything, but we all know boiling is not sterilizing, right? Okay, but you do boil everything, then you put it all in there. You're supposed to put the jars down in this big pot that has a lid that seals on it, it's a pressurized cooker. You're supposed to can under pressure so that the high pressure will pop open those Clostridium botulinum endospores. So if you can something and you don't do it under pressure, you could have botulism growing in your cans and not know it. Now saying that, I've got 20 jars of muscadine jelly sitting on my counter right now that I am so proud of. And that's a lot of work. If I've never made jelly before, it's a lot of work. You don't pressurize jelly when you make it. So you just have to hope that you didn't do anything wrong and you didn't accidentally get a bacteria in there that you didn't take care of by doing everything proper technique. Okay? The one thing that I really want you to pay attention to here that I think will affect your life the most importantly is the fact that Clostridium botulinum is found in honey. Not just honey you collect yourself or you buy from Bob down the street. Honey you buy in the grocery store has very small amounts of Clostridium botulinum endospores in it. So have you ever been told you're not supposed to give a child under two years old honey? This is why. Okay? There have been many cases of children becoming paralyzed, losing parts of their motor function, going to the hospital, it taking days for them to figure out what's wrong with this child, and it was, oh, you were letting them lick honey off your finger. And a lot of grandparents still think that's cute to do because honey is real sweet. And when a baby's too small to eat a piece of cake, the, you know, a grandma thinks it's really cute to put that little piece of honey on their finger and the little kid will just you know, go nuts over that sugar. But it's really, really bad to do. You have to keep children away from honey. Kara is three years old now. She may have had honey, but I can guarantee you she didn't have it when she was any younger than two years old. It's a very big no-no when you have children. Okay. All right. No pictures of that. Doesn't do anything to you. All right. Now we can look at leprosy. So when I say leprosy, what what do you guys know about it? Before I start just rambling. So I, if, <laughs> Jesus healed the lepers. Okay. So it's been around a long time, right? What else? Okay. Leper colonies, body parts falling off. All right. So that's usually what I hear. Okay? So there's some of that that's true, some of it that's not true. Okay? Now, when we say leprosy, those are people that have had a disease caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium leprae, for a long period of time. And the only way you can get it 
is to be around somebody with it for a very long period of time. Okay? So if I had leprosy, you guys could take my class this whole semester and none of you would get leprosy. You have to live with someone for years to contract leprosy from them. Okay? So we don't really know, I'm sure none of you know anyone that has leprosy. right? That's because we didn't know what was going on 60 years ago in the United States, but we knew that person looked weird. You know, something wrong was going on there because they didn't have their fingers, they didn't have their toes, they had leprosy. So we called them a leper and we said, since we don't know what's wrong with them, let's just round them all up plus their families and let's ship them off and make them all live by themselves together. And that's what's called a leper colony. We really did that in our history. Okay? Now you can think of it two ways. Number one, yes, Americans are kind of mean as a culture. We just round people up that we don't like and we ship them off. But on the other side of it, well, here's my defense for it. None of us have leprosy because somebody did that. So is it a nice way to eradicate a disease? Well, no, not really. But I mean, we didn't, we didn't line them up and just destroy them all. We just isolated them where the disease would not spread anymore. Does anybody know what states we sent the lepers to? Where are the leper colonies? Hawaii. That's one good place, right? It's down there by itself. Louisiana is the other place. South Louisiana. You can visit leper colonies in South Louisiana and in Hawaii. They still have some of them that were active. Because not only did we send the leper 50, 60 years ago, we sent their whole family. So if somebody was two years old, are they still alive? Yeah, they only be like 52, 62 years old. There are still people that live in the leper colony. They may have leprosy, they may not. Okay? I guess they could, but I mean they were raised there. I don't know if they would want to. You know, you think about it, you've been shunned for 60 years. I don't think I would just pop up and say, heck yeah, I'm going to Vegas, you know, and just, you know, incorporate into the society when you haven't been part of society. But there is no law that's keeping anyone there. Okay? So let's explain some of this scientifically. Do the body parts just fall off? No. Okay? They're not just walking down the street and all of a sudden their finger falls off. All right? But that's kind of the picture we get in our mind. What happens, the bacteria, mycobacterium likes cooler temperatures. So it moves into the extremities. When you first get the bacteria living in the, nervous, in the nerves in the extremities, it destroys the nerve. So you lose sensation. You have no more feeling in those areas. So if you lose feeling and you can't feel any of your fingers or toes anymore, they may not fall off. But could you see how over time you may lose small parts of them and you wouldn't necessarily realize it? Okay. You don't have any blood circulating there. Right. So if I slam my finger in the door, I'm going to say a few choice words, right? It's going to hurt like heck. Blood's going to rush to that finger. It's going to throb. If I have no nerves in my finger, if I slam my finger in the door, I don't even know it happened. So you lose all the blood flow, and you just slowly lose parts of your fingers, your toes. A lot of times it's called club hand or club foot because you have no extremities. Sometimes they'll lose parts of their nose, parts of their ears. It starts in the extremities. You don't really die from leprosy. You usually die of old age. You're just not real pretty by the time you end up dying of old age. It's just a, it's just a disease that's no fun to have. It makes your life pretty difficult to live. Now, we don't really have this in the United States, as I said, because we had those leper colonies. But in some countries, it's commonplace to walk down the street and see somebody with a like a crutch or a walking cane that has one normal foot and one club foot because leprosy just runs rampant. India is one country that has the highest population of lepers living in this natural society. So I have a few um, leprosy videos to show you. And this is a long video. I'm not watching the whole thing. I just want to be able to show you some of the people's um, hands and feet. Okay. So she's got her toes, so I'm not really sure what's going on in the video right now. I think they're just, oh, there we go. So it's a club foot. 
See, his fingers are all deformed. He has no blood flow anymore. They start to lose small pieces, and they just wrap them up. Right? So knuckles are all messed up. And see, these are normal people just in society. They're not shunned away. And they're just hanging out doing their normal thing. If we walked down the street and we saw someone sitting there with no fingers and no toes, we would look at that as odd. Right? They don't look at this as odd because it's just it's, it's normal for them. Okay? So this is another one of those, you know, thank goodness I live in the United States kind of things. Now there is an animal in the United States that very commonly has Mycobacterium leprae on him and in him at all times. Do you know what it is? Armadillo. And if I said leopard yesterday and I was like, how funny is that? Now I hear it again. The armadillo carries leprosy. Could we get leprosy from an armadillo? Well, you got to live with them for a long time, right? So remember, you got to you have to live with the person or the animal for extended periods of time. No one's ever going to keep an armadillo as a pet. It's just not something that happens. You're, um, I had a bulldog that used to kill armadillos all the time, and he never got leprosy. You you can't just be around it for a second and get it. You would have to be around it for a long period of time. If you ever have the chance to get close to an armadillo, though, I mean, like, don't pick it up. Like, they're kind of mean, but. If you had the opportunity to look at one, they're not real pretty underneath their shell. They got like all gnarly feet and their nose is crooked. It's because they have leprosy. They're not pretty creatures. The shell is just usually all you can see because they're hidden under that shell for protection. But, or shell. <laughs> Maybe so. They do have leprosy though. There's one at the Audubon Zoo. Uh, we go to the Audubon Zoo all the time. They have a little area where kids can walk through and, or, or adults like me can push the kids out of the way and walk through and touch different animals in the little area. And they always have an armadillo out there and let the kids touch it. And it just kind of creeps me out. I know you can't get it that way, but it's just still the thought of, oh, he has leprosy. Let's pet him. You know, I don't know. But we do that. All right. So that ends our discussion of diseases in the nervous system. So as I said in our textbook, it seems like, man, we're just moving from chapter to chapter. We're just picking little things out of chapters. Okay? So I guess now we would be in chapter 23. These are diseases of the cardiovascular and lymphatic system. Okay? So a little bit of A and P. Your cardiovascular system includes what? Your heart and your, your blood vessels that circulate your blood through your body. Okay? Your lymphatic system circulates through your body carrying other fluids and it dumps into your blood. Okay? So when we're looking at these diseases, we're really looking at diseases that are kind of just traveling through your whole body using your bloodstream or your lymphatic system to get to different places. Okay? So you're not going to be able to say, oh, all these are diseases of the heart. It's not like that. We're looking at diseases that are systemic, bacteria that love to move through your system through your blood. Okay? So we start here with basic heart disease. And you'll say, I thought heart disease was genetic. Well, some of it is. But some heart disease is caused by bacterial infections. And I've said this before, does anybody remember where the bacteria comes from that likes to live in your heart? Your teeth. Improper oral hygiene. So if you leave the bacteria on your teeth too long, you get cavities, which are little holes in your teeth. The bacteria can move into the pulp cavity, the center of your tooth, into your bloodstream. He travels through your blood. He hangs out in your heart and causes heart disease. Now, some of these terms are just based off of where the bacteria is really hanging out in your heart. Endocarditis means it's on the inside. The endocardium is the inside of the heart. Pericarditis is the pericardium, the outside of the heart. But it's all still just bacteria from the mouth infecting the heart. Okay? If you look at this picture here, I know you guys may have no idea what you're looking at, but the inside of the heart has these little flaps called valves that control blood so that your blood only goes one direction. You don't want your blood going the other way. Right? And so the flaps have to open, close, open, close. The flaps are nice, supposed to be nice, pretty, shiny white. And then everything underneath it, these little fibrous string things that hang down, are supposed to be bright, pretty red. 
Okay. In this picture, okay, here's your nice pretty red chordate tendinae, the little things hanging down. Okay. This what looks like fat clumps, the white stuff, that is big clumps of bacteria inside of this person's heart. So this is someone that died of heart disease and they cut the heart open and took this picture. This is a very intense infection in the heart. So the point I'm trying to make from this, brush your teeth, all right? Well, I mean, you can have heart disease other ways, but this is the only way you get this bacteria in your heart is from not brushing your teeth enough, okay? Um, and I should, I'm saying this on the recorder so people listening could care less about this, but you guys all go to Pearl River Community College. Do you know that you can get your teeth cleaned for free? Yes. So if you don't have dental insurance, you can go right downstairs to the dental hygiene department Sign up for an appointment, and they will clean your teeth for free. They will even x-ray them. You may have to pay at most $20, $25 for the x-rays, but it costs $150 if you just go to a dentist. Okay? When you go down there, tell them you want a second year student to clean your teeth. <laughs> then you're getting somebody that is just as good as paying $150 to go to. Now, the first years are not bad. I'm not saying that, but there's nothing wrong. I actually let them clean my teeth because it's a lot easier just to run down there and do it than it is to go to the dentist and make an appointment. So just a little FYI. You don't get your teeth cleaned so your heart doesn't look like this. All right. <coughs> Sorry, I had to cough. All right. Our next disease is anthrax caused by bacillus anthracis. So there again, bacillus we think endospore. So do you guys remember hearing about anthrax in the news about 10 years ago? Yeah. What was going on? There was some guy that was sending you anthrax in the mail. Okay. So before you had had a science class, you should have been thinking, how can they send a disease in the mail? Well, there's actually several ways you can get anthrax. Okay. So before we get to the mail part of it, there's two ways you can get anthrax that are not necessarily going to kill you. You just may not feel real good for a while. You can get cutaneous anthrax where let's say I already have a cut on my arm and the bacillus anthracis endospores get in that cut. It's just going to make the cut turn into a black eschar, which means it will make the cut that funky black color. Okay? You're not going to die from that. That has a 20% mortality rate. That's if you don't go to the doctor. Okay? If you ingest the bacillus anthracis endospores, you may have the worst diarrhea you could ever imagine, or it, it could actually kill you. You got about a 50-50 chance of surviving if you ingest a disease-causing load of the bacteria. Now, what really is important to us in our discussion is pulmonary anthrax. If you inhale the, in, the anthrax spores, it has a 100% mortality rate. So this is something we keep on our list of possible bioterrorist threats. If somebody released large amounts of anthrax spores, whoever inhaled it would die from it. There's no, well, couldn't you give them this and that? No. If you inhale enough of it, there's really nothing we can do about it. You can get it other ways, too, besides bioterrorism. There, um, have been cases of people buying really old houses and renovating the houses when they would go in the attic. In the dust, you would have bacteria, fungus, all sorts of things, and they inhaled anthrax spores that way. The spores just live in the environment. There's really no way of knowing it's only going to be here or it's only going to be there. Okay, so let's think about this guy that was mailing the anthrax. He, uh, he mailed it to a lot of pretty important people, right? He wasn't mailing the bacteria. What was he mailing? Just a powder that contained the endospores. So when you open the letter, it would aerosolize into the air, and if you're breathing at the time you happen to open the mail, you inhale the spores, and you could die from it if you inhaled them as they were coming out. And you have to inhale more than one. That's why I'm being kind of vague. You have to inhale enough of them, okay? But he killed several people. He did go to jail for this. They figured out who he was. I don't know how. I didn't follow it that closely. But here's what I think is interesting about that story. How did he get anthrax spores to mail them around? 
You think you can just go buy those if you get in the mood? No. Can you even buy Bacillus anthracis to grow it? I can't. I don't have a security clearance to do that. If, if Dr. Amanda Parker from Pearl River Community College requested Bacillus anthracis, I'm pretty sure I would get some guys in suits coming to talk to me and want to know why are you trying to buy this bacteria. Like I got this student with a smart mouth named James and I am trying to get rid of him. Now, you opened your mouth first. It was your fault. But so, so how did this guy get him? The guy that did this, he had a level four security clearance. He worked for the CDC and somebody peed him off. He was a smart guy. Think about what he had to do. He had, well, he did get caught, but he was a smart guy science-wise. He had to be able to grow the bacteria, which you guys know how to grow bacteria now, right? right? Okay. But he had to be able to grow them to large enough quantities. Then he had to be mean enough to them to make them make an endospore. Purify the endospore. Now here's the important part. While he was doing all this, he didn't kill himself. You know, he's dealing with spores that if he inhaled them, he would have died. So he was a pretty bright guy. He got a lot of trouble for it. I'm sure he's still in jail for doing this. But really kind of scary that people that smart, most of your serial killers actually are extremely intelligent. So just kind of crazy to think about. All right. <clears throat> Next disease is gangrene. Now, everybody listen closely because you guys all miss this on tests. Gangrene is not caused by bacteria. Okay? What? Okay, so let's look at three words, and I'm going to ask you to tell me what gangrene is. Ischemia is loss of blood supply. Once you no longer have blood flowing to a certain area of your body, the tissue becomes necrotic. The tissue dies because it has no blood flow. Okay? Then you get gangrene which is the soft tissue on the very inside, begins to die. Does that have anything to do with bacteria? Do you know of anything that could cause gangrene? Okay, so let's say I have a severe allergic reaction. My foot inflames to the point that I lose blood flow to certain parts of my toes. They could become gangrenous. What if I have diabetes? Right? That's what most people come up with. You can get gangrene, and it has nothing to do with bacteria. Now, here's where the bacteria comes into play. Once a tissue is already gangrenous, meaning you already have gangrene, the tissue is already dead, then a bacteria called Clostridium perfringens, written up here somewhere, okay, an obligate anaerobe says, ooh, I like this area. It's dead tissue. If there's no blood flow, is there oxygen flow into that tissue? Nope. So that obligate anaerobe says, oh my gosh, I love it here, and starts growing like crazy inside of the dead tissue. Then you get gas gangrene. The tissue becomes juicy. For a bit. I can't think of a better word. It starts to bubble from the gas that's being produced. It starts oozing. You get really nasty types of gangrene. That's when the bacteria comes into play. So if I have gas gangrene on my foot and I go to the doctor, what are they going to do to treat that? They're going to cut it off. Here's my favorite wrong answer I get on tests. And, this is, and students have written this so many times in the past. I get the answer that says, well, the tissue's dead. You put them in a hyperbaric chamber, which has high oxygen. That's true. You can do that. Here's the good part. The tissue will come back to life. Do y'all understand why that's funny? That's like the movie Resident Evil. Is that really possible? I, that I hope not, right? You can't bring something back to life. If you have gas gangrene, they have to cut the dead tissue off. And then they may put you in a hyperbaric chamber to make sure the high oxygen kills all of the bacteria that happens to be in your body because he hates oxygen. But all they can do is chop pieces of it off. Now, they're going to take off minimum required. They're not going to say, oh, it's in your big toe. Let's just cut knee down just to make sure we get it all. They're going to just take smallest amounts they can. Now, I have some pictures or some videos, of course, 
And these are kind of gross sometimes, so just beware as we watch them. Now these are these are diabetic cases. So at first it's just going to be gangrene, but I want you to try to see if you can tell when it becomes gas gangrene. Can you tell when it becomes juicy, for lack of a better word? See how it's starting to ooze? So now this has already been clean. Those are bones sticking out. This has already been treated by a doctor cutting dead tissue away. This is not gas gangrene. This is just somebody's foot that they're working on. Okay. So let's go to a different one. I couldn't remember which one I clicked first. I think this is the different one. All right, here we go. Oh, it's sped up too fast. Let's start back over. So when they first show it to you, it is gas gangrene. See how it's all swollen? Oh, we're into the table. And it's, it's oozing and leaking out. That is the gas gangrene. As this person, as this slideshow progresses, the doctors start working on it. See, there's another big swollen area in the pad of the foot. He's also got jaundice. But anyway, so then here they start working on it. They start cutting tissue away, trying to fix the problem. Hey, you can see they had to cut a toe off. Okay. So he's starting to get better. That's what they show you throughout the video. Believe it or not, y'all may think, oh my God, that looks gross. That's way healthier than it was in the very beginning of the video. At least the tissue is now red. So they've gotten rid of dead tissue. Now this is living tissue again. So they were able to take care of the problem. Okay. Mm. All right. So now let's look at the plague. Any of you um, history buffs? Anybody in here like history? Good. I'm not a history person, so y'all correct me if I'm wrong as we go through this. Okay. Why do we? What do we think of when we hear the word plague? Okay, good. Middle Ages, right? The Black Death, which is what we called it. Okay, back in the 1500s, did we know it was the plague? They all of them thought it was a punishment from God. Okay, now was it? Well, it may have been. God may have been the one that decided I'm going to invent this bacteria to punish y'all. We don't know, but I do know that it was Yersinia pestis, a little teeny tiny bacteria that was the ultimate cause of the Black Death, the plague. Okay? Now, this can be a long discussion, but we're going to keep it to the what you have to know, and then we'll, I'll answer any questions you have. Okay? The bacteria that causes this, Yersinia pestis, has a reservoir. Do you all remember what that word means? What's a reservoir? It's a carrier. That's a good word. Okay? It's an organism that has the infection has the bacteria. It carries it around. In this case, it's not harmed by the infection. It's just carrying it. Yersinia pestis lives in rats, squirrels, uh, prairie dogs. Okay, do we have any of those in the United States? Tons of them, right? So, do you think we have Yersinia pestis in the United States? We do. Okay. Now, to get an infection from the reservoir, the squirrel or the rat, you need a vector. You guys remember what a vector is? Something that can transmit the infection from one organism to another. In this case, it's a flea. So a flea has to bite the squirrel or the rat and then jump on you and bite you. Okay? So say I'm back in the 1500s and I'm living in my house. There's no such thing as um, the exterminator to come make sure you don't have rats in your house. You have rats in your house. Okay? They didn't even really have houses like we think of. They had big forts. You know, a castle's not Cinderella's castle is a fairy tale. A castle was basically a big fort wall that surrounded the community, and then people lived within that. Okay? So there were rats. There were these small little populations of people, and the rats, and all lived pretty closely together. So if I had rats in my house and a flea jumped on me and bit me, well, he may give me Yersinia pestis. Now I have the plague. Okay? That bacteria is going to travel through my lymphatic system, really make my lymph nodes mad. Because okay? what happens inside of lymph nodes, do you guys know why they swell up? It's trying to fight an infection. You have T cells and B cells inside those lymph nodes, and they swell up fighting the infection. So I would first get the key sign that I have the plague called a bubo. That's what this picture is. 
this is in the axillary or groin region, those are extremely swollen lymph nodes. That's where the word bobo comes from. Like if you tell your kid, oh, you have a bobo, it comes from the word bubo because that's one of the oldest bobos we have on record. Okay? So now I've got these bubos. I've got swollen lymph nodes. Now I have an active infection of the plague. It is eventually going to make my whole body inflamed. So I get real red, flushed cheeks. You can tell I have the plague. Eventually it's going to shut down my cardiovascular system and I will die from the plague. But while I'm alive, I can now spread the plague from myself to you by breathing on you. So once I get it, I can start to spread it respiratory. So whole communities would die from the plague. Okay? Now, a lot of people relate this back to this is also the time when we started having trade between communities. That's how plague was transmitted from one little group of people to another. And um, there's a really good History Channel uh, documentary on this. You can watch it online if you are ever interested. They even relate it to a lot of people thought it was um, kind of the first Holocaust because a lot of people said, oh, the Jewish people are the ones that are transmitting the plague. And a lot of Jewish people were murdered because they thought they were the ones spreading the plagues. It's just got this amazing history if, you, if you're ever interested in it. Okay? Um, somebody said it makes me think of Ring Around the Rosie. So what is that? That's, mm, that's from this, the plague. That's a nursery rhyme, right? Kids, my kid still does it to this day. What does it say? Ring Around the Rosies, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Does that kind of make sense? Ring around, ring around the rosy. What is the ring around the rosy? You just said it, actually. You get red rings around your buboes. You also have real red flushed cheeks from all the inflammation. Pocket full of posies. What are posies? They, they're flowers, right? They thought that they had a healing effect. So pocket full of posies, if they're going to heal me, let's protect myself with them. If you die, here's some flowers. I'll give you some too. Let's put them all around you to make sure I don't get anything from you. Ashes, ashes, why ashes? We burn their bodies. We know what else to do. What does we all fall down mean? We all going to die. Isn't that just heartwarming for a group of kids to run around singing? But this was part of life. So if you knew it was going to happen, at least I guess... Have a little fun with it while you're a kid. But it's just a, it's a devastating disease on our history. Really neat. Now taking the history part away from it, you could contract the plague in the United States. We're not all going to die from it if you get it because now we know how to treat it if you go to the doctor. Okay, so um, I guess it's a good time to bring up, you guys ever watch the TV show Monsters Inside Me? on Animal Planet, okay. you can go to AnimalPlanet.com, click on TV shows, Monsters Inside Me, and they take those 30-minute episodes and shrink them down to little five-minute segments you can watch. So if you get tired of just studying some boring PowerPoints, Lord knows you don't want to listen to me again. You already had to listen to me once. Go to Monsters Inside Me. You can search different diseases and watch little five-minute videos, and they're very good ways to study for this test. There's a good one on the plague. It's about a guy that goes, I believe he goes somewhere in the northeast, like New York, some big city, and he contracts the plague. And it takes a long time before they figure out what's wrong with him. So just a, a little hint for you guys. I think it's a good way to study, a little more interesting than just reading. From the plague? Oh, maybe so. That makes sense. I mean, why else would we say God bless you when somebody sneezes? I have no idea where it comes from. I don't know. But I'm saying that actually makes sense because that's how you get it from a person that already has it is them breathing on you, sneezing on you. Uh, your heart doesn't really stop when you sneeze. But um, that, that isn't all wives tell too. I have no idea where that term comes from. Huh. That's interesting. Okay. I love it when y'all teach me something I new. I can tell my class that next time. All right. So last one of the day. Let's look at Lyme disease. And this is our last one because this is the last disease in the cardiovascular lymphatic system. 
next week we'll do respiratory, gastrointestinal, and um, genitourinary. So see, we really don't have that many left to do. Okay. Lyme disease is another one of those diseases that has a reservoir and a vector. The etiology or the causative agent of Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. That's probably the weirdest name we've seen so far for bacteria. I agree with you, but at least it's one of the few weird ones, so it's easy to keep up with where it goes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Borrelia burgdorferi lives in deer. Okay. You can eat deer meat and not get Lyme disease because to get Lyme disease, you need the vector, which is a tick, to bite the deer and then come bite you. Once he bites you, you'll get swelling at the site where the tick bites you. Okay, so those of you city folks who've never been bitten by a tick, let me tell you what it feels like. Okay? So when a tick bites you, he doesn't just bite you and let go. He grabs a hold and he sucks blood. Okay? So when you find the tick and he bit you, you pull him off. Okay? Where you pull him off is going to be a red dot. Okay? Your body's going to say, what the heck was that? Your immune system doesn't like it. So you get inflammation. You get swelling. So no matter what tick bites you, it's going to turn red and swell. Okay? You don't have Lyme disease. The way you know you have Lyme disease is outside of this initial red spot that swells, you get a second red spot. And then a few hours later, another red spot. So within a day of pulling that tick off of you, you get what's called the bullseye. The bullseye means something's wrong. You have Lyme disease. It only reacts this way if the Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria is specifically what your immune system is fighting. Now, once it's bitten you, the bacteria is not just hanging out right there underneath your skin. It immediately dumps into your bloodstream, moves into your heart, causing an irregular heartbeat. If you keep it and you don't go get treatment for it, very treatable here, but if you keep it and don't go get treatment, it will eventually make its way into your joints and cause arthritis. It can even cause encephalitis. It can kill you if you keep Lyme disease. Okay? Now, I don't know about y'all, but if something bit me, I don't care what it is, and I saw that, I'd go to the doctor, right? But for those of you that are weird like me, so I grew up in the country. I've had ticks on me before. Does the tick like to bite you right there on your arm? Where does he like to land? Where does he like to move before he grabs a hold? Some nice warm, dark spot. Okay, I can always remember as a kid getting them behind my ear. You can't see that in the mirror. They like the bottom of your hairline. If I have a bullseye pattern under all my hair, can you see that? You don't know that's there. Okay? They like armpits. They like genital regions where there's folds and dark spots. They like, I'm trying to think of a better term than like a butt crack. They like to get in places where they can hide. So it's a, sometimes it's hard to see that ring. When dogs get bit, it's hard to see the ring. They're covered in hair. But you can vaccinate your dogs against Lyme disease. Okay? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer to that. Why is Lyme disease more common than the plague? Because there are more rats than there are deer. You know, it may have something to do, and I'm just guessing, but when a flea bites you, it's not quite the same bite as a tick. So when a tick bites you, he he latches on and he spills everything out of his gut into you. The flea may not get a chance to suck blood. He may just bite and not actually get to suck blood. So it may have something to do with that. But I don't know if I really know how to answer your question. Mm -hmm. If you leave a tick on there long enough, he's kind of a pain to get to get off of. You can't just thump him and him fall off. You got to really grab a hold of him and and get him off. And you can burn them. Even if I was saying you can burn them off, you can suffocate them. You pour like a, a mineral oil on them, they'll suffocate and they'll let go. But, you know, just most important thing, once you get them off, watch the spot where you pulled it off of. Okay? So um, I'll, I'll end today with my funny story that um, 
I think it's kind of funny, but um, it has really nothing to do with what you need to know. My husband and I, after we had first, I can't remember if we were married or if we had just been dating for a while, engaged or whatever, but we went on a hiking trip to Arkansas. Okay? Now, I've lived in the country all my life. I've been in the woods. You may get a tick on you. You may not. Okay? But let me tell you guys something about Arkansas, if you've never been to Arkansas before. We went hiking. Hey, walking around, we, you know, we've been half mile, mile, we haven't been hiking too far yet. All of a sudden, my husband says, all right, let's go, I'm ready to go, let's go, we're going to turn around. He turns around and starts walking out, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm a woman, so I start complaining, I start questioning, why are we leaving, what's wrong, why do you want to leave, I'm not tired yet, are you tired yet, I don't want to go yet. So as I'm complaining and we're walking out, I kind of notice, it looks like I've got pepper on my socks. Oh, we must have walked through some grass that has, you know, like the Bermuda grass has the black seeds. So he's just steady walking, not wanting to talk to me. And so then finally I kind of get to look him like, what the heck is that, you know? And I notice those little teeny tiny things that are smaller than little pieces of pepper are crawling. We have walked through ticks, and they are literally just thousands of them crawling up our legs. So... Then I quit complaining, and I walk a little faster, and we walk out. And uh, But luckily, we were in Arkansas. So we were by a river. So as soon as we got out of there, we, we got in the water and rinsed off. And um, we got to know each other a lot better because you have to really check each other. Them little ticks are teeny, tiny little guys. So just, just my little warning for you. If you ever go to Arkansas hiking, don't just, just don't do it. So check yourself really, really well when you're done because their ticks are tiny. So I probably shouldn't have done that on record. <laughs>